Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for an opportunity today to spend the afternoon with friends. Lord, we're thankful for an opportunity to uh, bring our families together and to have food. Um, Lord, as we sit here this afternoon um, to get fed from your word, we pray that you'd bless it and that, God, you would help us to understand your word, that it would be simple and clear, and that, Lord, we'd all be encouraged. We love you, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. On May 25th, 1961, President John F. Kennedy stunned the world in a speech he gave to a joint session of Congress. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. He followed this up with a, in a later address the next year. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and to do other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. President Kennedy's words, they moved hearts all throughout the world. It was so ambitious. No one had ever imagined doing something like this since the Panama Canal in the 1880s. It was incredible. Every American wanted the same thing that President Kennedy wanted. They wanted America to go to the moon. You know, no matter how ambitious the goal was that Kennedy was suggesting, no matter uh, how exciting it might have seemed, to those at NASA, what President Kennedy was suggesting America do, it seemed impossible. I mean, the U.S. had barely spent 15 minutes in space at the time President Kennedy gave his first speech. And so the science, it just didn't exist. It wasn't there. And to many listening, what the president was putting America, the, the direction the president was putting America on was a dream beyond their reach. How many of us have ever ha asked, some, someone ever asked you to do something that seemed beyond you? Something uh, out of your reach? Something that you felt unqualified for. A uh, family I know well, they had a decision to make a while back. My friend's dad, had, he had visited the public school that his kids were going to. I think there was an event going on. But after he saw what was going on at the school and the, uh, what they were imposing on his children, the environment that the kids were put in, he comes home and he talks to his wife and he says, Dear, I, I really think we should start homeschooling our girls. That caught her completely off guard. I mean, wow. Uh, it wasn't that she didn't want to do what her husband was asking her to do, but she had never gone to college. Um, she had no experience in any homeschool curriculum. More importantly, they were members of a small church in the country, and so there was no one around that would guide her and help her get started. And so in her mind, what her husband wanted seemed impossible. Picture someone here, you know, they, they're wanting to get more involved in the church, and so they look for different ways they can get plugged in, and they're happy how things are going, and uh, they find a few places where they think they can fill a niche, and uh, when suddenly, you know, that, the, the pastors of the church, you know, they get, a, they get wind of it, and so someone pulls her aside, they say, you know, we've been praying about this, and we really think you'd be perfect for our college and career class. Uh, now, I mean, getting involved was one thing. But this person, you know, you, you, you've never stood in front of a crowd of more than two people in your life. I mean, it was, uh, it was one thing to get involved, but to teach? That's not what you signed up for. From where you sit, what the pastors are asking for, it's, it's just, it's too much. It's beyond your reach. Sometimes God asks us to do things like that. Things that are just, seem, they seem out of our reach. He asked Noah to build an ark, one so large that could fit two animals, two of every kind of animal on earth. He asked Moses to oh, oh, spread his arms and open the Red Sea. He asked a young shepherd boy, that, or he told a young shepherd boy that one day he would be the king of a nation. Things that to us seem impossible. God asks us, us to do things like that sometimes. In the passage we'll look at today, 
We're going to see Jesus doing that. Jesus is going to instruct us to do something that to us might seem impossible. Something that's beyond your reach. Beyond you. We'll hear Jesus telling us to forgive those who've hurt us, no matter what they've done, and no matter how many times they've done it. And he's also going to encourage us that what he's suggesting is not beyond our reach, but it's within our reach. He does this by showing us how we can obey him. In other words, Jesus, he'll tell us what it will take for us to accomplish such a difficult task and forgive like that. What's more, Jesus will give us his reasons for asking this of us. He'll tell us on what grounds he can demand such a difficult thing. And so, this afternoon, we'll look at first the commandment to forgive. Then we'll look at how we can do it. And finally, we'll see why we as his people should obey him. The commandment that I'm referring to today, it it comes just after the story of a man who had lived a scandalous life. He'd uh, offended God and he was selfish to others. Jesus describes how in the end, this man, he suffered an even worse fate in death. Uh, Turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17. Luke, chapter 17. The crowd, they're still mulling over the end of that last parable, the story of the rich man who's now in hell and Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. And as that's on their mind, Jesus, he shifts his attention back to his disciples. He says to them and to us that we should expect the world to offend us and scandalize us, much as the rich man did to Lazarus. In verse 1, then he said unto his disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. The word for offenses here is where we get our English word scandal or scandalize. And so in essence, Jesus is telling us that men are going to scandalize you. They're going to offend you. And Jesus promises nothing but misery for those that would do this to God's people. He says, woe unto him for whom they, these offenses, come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he cast into a sea, into the sea, than that he would offend one of these little ones. Here, Jesus, he paints the picture of uh, someone who they've abused God and they've abused his people. Jesus said that it would be better for someone like that who would do that such a thing, who would scandalize his people to wrap a cord around their neck and tie it to a large millstone, and cast themselves into the ocean, than to bear the punishment for what they've done. Now that's a disturbing image. It's almost as disturbing as Jesus' last image of uh, the rich man begging for water in hell. But Jesus is giving us this picture for a reason. He's trying to distinguish, to compare the way the world treats us with the way that we, as his disciples, should be treating each other. And it's at this point he says, take heed to yourselves. In other words, the world may offend you. The world may scandalize you. But I'm Jesus' disciple. And I'm not to treat my brother. I'm not to treat others the way the world treats me. And it's here that Jesus introduces an incredible commandment. He begins it by instructing us to hold each other accountable. This first part, it's not too difficult. We read here, If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. Suppose someone, he hurts you, or uh, he does you wrong, Jesus says you're to correct him. He says, I'm to uh, call my brother out when I'm mistreated. Makes sense. It's the rest of the commandment that's the difficult part for most of us. He says in the rest of the verse, he says, and he says that if my brother, who he's wronged me, if he later comes and he apologizes for what he did, Jesus says, 
at that point that we are to forgive those who've wronged us, no matter what they've done. And if he repent, the verse reads, forgive him. My brother, he's offended me. And uh, later in the day, he regrets it. He thinks about what he's done, and he's convicted by it. He, Jesus says here, if he comes to me and he says, I'm sorry, Jesus says, I'm to let it go. But if that weren't hard enough, verse 4 is the icing on the cake. He says in the next verse that not only are we to forgive them no matter what they've done, but we're to forgive our brothers no matter how many times they've wronged us. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. My brother, he's come to me, he's hurt me. And he apologizes. This verse is telling me that even if he's hurt me over and over and over again, I'm to let it go every time. Again and again and again. No matter what he's done and no matter how many times he might have done it. Now, friend, that is an incredible commandment. But it begs the question, what does Jesus mean by forgive? Uh, My brother asks me to forgive him. What does he mean by that? James Dobson wrote a book uh, on marriage entitled Love Must Be Tough. And in that book, Dobson points to a definition on forgiveness, which I think is helpful here. Dobson says, quote, Forgiveness is surrendering my right to hurt you for hurting me. And so according to Dobson, when I forgive somebody, what I'm doing is I am giving up my right to hold a grudge against that person. If I forgive you, I let it go. No matter what you've done to me, it doesn't matter. If I'm to forgive someone, Dobson says, I let it go. Even if someone, they've done something to me repeatedly. And in this verse, it says seven times in a day. If that person repents, I'm to forgive him every time. Jesus' disciples, Jesus' apostles, they're in the crowd. They're standing with the the group of disciples, and they're listening to this. They're overwhelmed. I mean, what Jesus is asking them to do, it seems impossible, right? I mean, only God could bring someone to forgive like that. Only he could give me the ability to do something like this. The apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith. The apostles, they already have faith. But what they're asking for is a greater, a stronger belief, that something that would enable them to do God's will. They're saying essentially, Lord, help us to believe in God more. Lord, uh, help us to trust more in what He can do. Lord, help us to have more confidence in God that will enable us to forgive like that. Increase our faith. But Jesus, he, he knows what the disciples are, what the apostles are asking for. This is not the answer. Uh, Christian, we don't need more faith or greater faith to forgive those who've hurt us, those who've done us wrong. And in the next verses, Jesus is going to demonstrate that. In these verses, we'll see that we already have everything that we need to do what Jesus is asking us to do here. Jesus, he gives us, he pictures two things for us in these verses. Uh, Jesus shows us something tiny, and he uh, shows us something big. We read, and the Lord said, if ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, Ye might say unto this sycamore tree, uh, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. Jesus is saying that someone who has faith as small as a tiny little mustard seed, that person could walk up to a giant sycamore tree, and uh, he can command the tree to pull its roots up, and to cast itself into the deep. And the tree would get up, pull its roots up, Turn around and it would do it. (laughs) Now that would be a sight. But what does Jesus mean here? 
I mean, what does, what does he mean when he refers to something like a mustard seed? If you had faith as the grain of a mustard seed. And why talk about something as big as a sycamore tree? He says you can say to this giant sycamore tree, move from here to there. What does he mean by that? The mustard seed was the smallest of all seeds in everyday Palestine. If I were to go to the marketplace and I were to buy a packet of seeds, and I were to go home and open up the pack and lay the seeds all across the table, understand the smallest of all of these seeds, that would be the mustard seed. And this would grow into what we know today as the mustard spice. And so well, what Jesus is referencing here with the mustard seed is he's calling attention to how little it would take or how potential this is for us. He's saying the, it, the littlest bit of what you're asking for is enough. And so what Jesus is asking, it's actually within our reach. It's achievable. All I need is just a tiny bit of faith. But second, why mention a sycamore tree? In Jesus' culture, the sycamore tree, to, to uproot a sycamore tree, this was practically impossible. I mean, these were large trees, right? They got up to 35 feet high, three stories in the air. Um, they didn't have bulldozers or cranes in those days. And so a sycamore tree had roots also that they went out up to 40 feet in every direction. And rabbis, when they talk about sycamore trees, they, they tell how these trees could stay on earth upwards to 600 years. And yet Jesus says that you and I could uproot a sycamore tree with just a, a little bit of faith. These two images that he gives us here, the mustard seed and the sycamore tree, show us how a little faith can enable us to forgive those who've hurt us. It doesn't matter what they've done. And it doesn't matter how many times they've wronged me. And that's because a little faith gives us access to a big God. But for Jesus, this is not the most important question. This is not the real issue. Jesus, while the disciples are concerned with their faith, that's not the issue for him. Jesus is primarily concerned with why we should do it. Why should I forgive like that? And so next, he's going to tell us on what grounds he can demand this. Why should I forgive others like that? He gives us his reason in verses 7 through 10. Jesus does this through a parable. He asks some questions. And his first question implies that, I, that we ought to obey Jesus because we're servants. He tells the disciples, imagine you had a slave. Uh, this guy, he's worked a long day in the field. Um, he comes in for the night. What does the master say to his slave? Does he say, sit down with me at my table and eat? Read with me here. But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by when he's coming from the field. Go and sit down to meet. Picture with me a master treating his servant as though he were a dinner guest. Uh, come along now, sit down and have some steak. Sit right here, boy. No, no, no master would do that. That's not how servants were treated. I can see a mom or a dad coming over after a long day of a long day at the office, they walk in the door, little Johnny and Susie, they're, they're standing there. Come on in, Mom and Dad. <laughs> You've worked long and hard. You come over here and sit down. We've made supper tonight. Don't you worry about a thing. And little Johnny, he'll put you to bed. Or maybe you could imagine a factory worker. Um, a few hours before the end of his shift, he's been uh, pushing really hard, and the supervisor comes over to him. He says, you know, come on in here, son. You, you, you put, up, put your feet up. Take a load off. So, uh, you've worked really hard today. Someone else can finish out the shift. I think the best example might be a waiter. Uh, Amy and I were with uh, Paul Romero earlier this week. We were at Sonny's Barbecue, and um, imagine our waiter. You know, she, she had a, several tables to work 
with that night. And uh, near the end of the meal, you know, Paul c- calls her over, you know, you've done such a great job. Hey, sit right down here. Amy pulls a, uh, a menu. Here you go. I look over at her. Do you like the dessert? You know, these are silly examples. But a factory worker is not the boss. Parents are not kids. The, the waiter, she's, she did a great job that night. But, I mean, during the meal, we're not equals. We don't have comparable status. She's not welcome at my table. And the same goes for a servant. A servant is still a servant, even after a hard day's work. And so, the reason that we obey Jesus and forgive, first is because we're servants. But the second question... Jesus gives in the parable. This one suggests that we're to forgive because that's what the master wants. And will not rather he say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself and serve me till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. The master, he turns to the servant, he says, Make my dinner, change my clothes. Serve me. It's time to wash up from the field. Prepare my food. Get it to the table. What Jesus is saying here is that a servant's work is never done. Uh, but what happens? Imagine the, he meets the master's need. The servant, he goes over and he begins to eat his supper. Suddenly the master, he has an unexpected need arise and a servant would know it's time to get up again. It's time to get up and go meet the na- master's need at that point. That's the life of a servant. And so the reason that we obey Jesus is because we're servants, but with the second question, we do it because that's what the master wants. A servant's job is to do whatever his master wants. And so now Jesus, he can ask his third and final question. And the last one here suggests that the reason I do what the master wants is because... It's my duty. Jesus asks, after all the servant does, has the servant made some impression on the master because he did what he was told to do? He says, does the master thank him? Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? Now, recognize this is the only question Jesus actually answers here. I trow not. In other words, when a servant does everything he's been told to do, when he has obeyed his master, he's still done nothing special. He's only done his duty. Now, uh, this idea of thanking a servant here, I I don't want us to misunderstand it. Okay, Uh, It's not about whether the master appreciates his servant or not. It's not about whether uh, the master is thankful or unthankful. That's not the point here. The point is... whether the servant has done anything praiseworthy. In other words, has the servant done something that deserves any special recognition because he did what he was told to do? No. The servant's only done his duty. And the only limit to our responsibility as disciples is our master's will. And so when you bring all of these questions together, uh, Jesus, all of these questions, they revolve around a larger question, don't they? Uh, Would a servant's role ever change? I mean, ever. If he works long or hard? Or after a, a, a lot of work, will the master ever become indebted to the servant? Because he did what he was told to do. Would the master ever owe anything to the servant? The disciples are listening, their ears all perked up. No. These questions tell us that a servant's role never changes. A servant's duty is to do whatever his master wants. And the final verse brings the message together here. Up to now, the disciples, they've been wearing the master's shoes in the parable as they listen. But with the final piece of the puzzle, Jesus, he flips it on them here. The disciples are not the master. They're the servant. 
So likewise ye, when ye have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which is our duty to do. And you see from this last verse, Christian, that these, this parable is not teaching us in what spirit God deals with us. This parable is not about the master. This parable in Luke 17 is reminding me, and it's reminding you, in what spirit we should be serving God. The reason I'm to forgive my brother or my sister, uh, those who've wronged us, it's, no matter what they've done, it doesn't matter, and it doesn't matter how many times they've done it, the reason I'm to forgive them is because I'm a servant. And a good disciple does whatever Jesus wants him to do. A good disciple is someone, they're always available. They're always ready to obey, no matter what the Lord asks, whether that's forgiving those who've wronged them or anything else the master may want of them. And a good disciple sees nothing particularly praiseworthy about that. That was good instruction for the disciples, and that's good instruction for us here today. And so, Christian, we, we, we remember Jesus' command in Luke 17 is for us to forgive those who've hurt us. No matter how many times they've done it, if they come to us, we're to, we're to forgive them. Now, that's an easy thing to hear. But if you're honest, we all know that's a hard thing to do. C.S. Lewis, he said that everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until we have something to forgive. But Christian, whether it's hard for me or not, that's what my master wants. That's what he's asking me to do. Forgiveness is not some elective I get to choose to take or not to take in my Christian life. It's, it's one of those required courses. You might call it uh, Christianity 101. And while lectures like this, they're fun and easy to sit through, we all know the tests are hard to pass. But Luke 17, it tells me something else. It encourages me because I know that all I need to forgive is just a tiny bit of faith. A little faith in a big God. Maybe you're sitting here and you're still struggling with why you need to do that. Why should I have to forgive someone like that? As impossible as forgiving them, they come to me seven times in a day and they've done me wrong. Well, this text serves as a reminder to you and to me that we are disciples, and it's what our master wants. The most powerful story I've ever heard on forgiveness was a book I read entitled Letters to My Father's Murderer. And in the book, Lori Combs tells of her journey toward forgiveness. She describes this tragedy of losing her dad in such a horrific way and how this, tra this uh, tragedy led her into a dark place in her life, one that lasted almost 10 years. She writes, <clears throat> They say that time heals wounds, but that's simply not true. Time only dulls the pain. Only God heals wounds. A few years um, into her, uh, her struggle, Lori finds Christ. She becomes a Christian. She gets saved. And in her Bible studies, in her own personal time with the Lord, she begins to learn that disciples are commanded not just to love, but to forgive their enemies. And so Lori Combs, she does the impossible. She begins to converse with the very man that killed her dad. They write letters back and forth for years. And those letters, they're in the book, uh, Letters to My Father's Murderer. And in time, God shows her how to not just forgive, but even come to love the very man who murdered her father. She writes, quote, I have witnessed God do the impossible. He has brought good out of evil, love out of hate, and peace out of despair. Such an encouraging story of forgiveness. And it's an incredible one, actually. But friend, this is just one story of forgiveness. And Lori Combs' story, it, it should be our story. It should be your story and my story. If we could just learn to be obedient and by faith take the risk that Lori Combs took and forgive those who've wronged us. I was teaching my daughter uh, to climb the monkey bars last year and um, <clears throat> Faith was so afraid to let go of those bars. 
And so it took her a long time to get up the courage. Um, and, but when she finally stepped out and took a risk, that was all it took. Forgiveness is a lot like that. Friend, you have to let go at some point if you ever want to move forward. Someone here, you're holding on to some hatred maybe, maybe some resentment that's happened in your past. Someone has done you wrong. And you're full of bitterness and anger. It's deep down in your heart. Maybe it's been some time and time has dulled that pain, but it's still there and you recognize it. And, but friend, when you learn to have just a little bit of faith and you learn to forgive, then you can say, like this servant did, I have done my duty. I did what I was told to do. And with that, we'll close with a word of prayer, and I believe we're dismissed. Father, we love you, and we thank you for the forgiveness you've shown each one of us here. Lord, forgiveness that we only have through Jesus. Lord, you have forgiven the inexcusable in us. You, you have forgiven so much for, uh, in our lives, Lord. We, it is not too much to ask for you to ask us as your disciples and your servants to forgive those who've hurt us. And Lord, it's hard sometimes, and I pray that you continue to stretch me and my family as we seek to forgive those who wrong us, as they will do, and as many know they've already done in our lives. But Lord, we, we ask for your grace and in, in, that you would encourage us to do just that, Lord. Help us to have the faith of a mustard seed and to trust you and forgive. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. With that, you're dismissed.